So welcome to the Rockwell Museum. This is the second installment of our Heroes Lecture Series. Um, for any of you who don't know me, I'm Kate Swanson. I'm Interpretation and Public Engagement Educator here at the Rockwell Museum. And I'm excited um, for our talk and our theme this year. As some of you probably know, in 2023, we're thinking about heroes, celebrating the courage of people moved by conviction, truth, and love to improve communities, societies, and our world. The effect of heroes is subtle and monumental, local and global, and lingers long after they're gone. I hope that you'll continue to attend all the lectures in our series now through April. And there are other very exciting hero-related programs throughout 2023, so be sure to always stay connected on our website so that you don't miss any. Um, and you may or may not know this as well, but speaking of heroes, tonight's talk, as well as last month's lecture with Brian Lintelman, uh, which is up on our YouTube channel if you missed it, they are made possible by our status as a Smithsonian affiliate. And I want to take a moment to recognize the affiliate's office, who generously dedicate so much time to helping us find the most engaging and relevant speakers to bring here to the Rockwell, bringing a little bit of the Smithsonian to Corning and the Southern Tier. We are actually the only Smithsonian affiliate in New York outside of New York City in the greater New York City area, so these programs are really special. So if you have any friends who don't know that, tell them. <laughs> I want to give special thanks to our long-term partner, Jennifer Brundage, um, and the affiliate's office, as well as all the other folks who work with her and ensure that we never miss an opportunity to bring exceptional programming and art here for you guys. In our lecture last month, which is available to view, um, we looked at larger-than-life fictional heroes and considered what they said about what we see as heroic in the real world. Today we're shifting quite a bit to think about the very real heroes that concern themselves with our planet. In 2017, the Smithsonian held its inaugural Earth Optimism Summit on Earth Day weekend, for which our speaker this evening, Nancy Dalton, and her work on ocean optimism was a catalyst, a big, big catalyst. <laughs> with so much bad news about the changing climate and humans' effect on the planet, what was there to be optimistic about? But on the other hand, how can we, and especially young people, move forward if we don't have any hope? Our speaker, Nancy Knowlton, will share examples this evening of conservation success and how she ended up finding more room for solutions and hope than she had ever imagined when she started asking these questions. Nancy Knowlton is former SANT Chair for Marine Science at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. She is a scientific leader of the Census of Marine Life and wrote the book Citizens of the Sea to celebrate the 10 years of the census. She founded the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation at the Scripps Institute of Ocean Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. And she's de devoted her life to studying, celebrating, and striving to protect the multitude of life forms that we that call the sea home. Before I officially turn things over to Nancy, uh, just be sure to take a moment to ensure that your devices of any sort are silent or turned off, um, and note that our emergency exits are in the rear of the room. During the presentation, be sure to hold your questions for Q&A with Nancy at the end of the talk. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks, Kate, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the Rockwell Museum and the Smithsonian for making this possible. I've had a wonderful day so far. I got to spend the morning at the Glass Museum and several magical hours this afternoon at the Rockwell. So I'm really happy uh, to be able to uh, share this, uh, my thoughts with you this afternoon. And this is definitely an inspiration to come back for a longer period of time with my family. So with that, uh, I'll turn to the, what I'd like to talk about today. Um, it, there's sort of a two-part title. Part of it is uh, about environmental heroes, which are really critical to the things that do give us hope in the environment. But it's, I think they're particularly important in the context of the fact that there is so much doom and gloom in the world uh, about many things, including the environment. And, and really, before I go any farther, I do want to acknowledge that it's not it's not ridiculous for people to feel depressed about the environment. Um, there, we're really sitting in the middle of two huge crises, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. 
And you see those illustrated by the two books that were published in the last decade uh, about those two problems. But they're hardly alone. There are many, many books about all the different things we're facing, including Ocean Outbreak, which is actually written by a colleague of mine uh, based at Cornell. Uh, there are many, many books you can read about all the bad things that are happening to the planet. And I don't want to, for a moment, um, undervalue the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Uh, just because I want to talk about successes. There's still huge problems. We're a long way from solving all of them. But I think it's important to recognize that there are solutions and actual successes out there as well, which is really the theme of my talk and the people who have made them possible. So because of all that bad news, um, we, uh, and, and all these books are written, and I'm sure you've read the articles in the various newspapers and other forms of media, um, we've kind of, for the last several decades, been in a, a standard conservation narrative, which is one of paradise lost. Was, we were in the Garden of Eden, and we had it great, and we messed it up, and now we're living in a really bad place. And um, I, speaking just personally, I have to say I have my own version of Paradise Lost. Um, because when I started studying coral reefs, which is what I'm actually an expert on, uh, in 1975 as a grad student, the reefs looked like that image uh, on the left uh, that you see of Discovery Bay, Jamaica, a picture I took as a graduate student a year after I'd started my work there. And you can see in the bottom that it's covered with all this live coral. I don't know how many of if you have been snorkeling or diving on coral reefs, uh, those of you who did it a long time ago probably saw reefs that looked like that, but any of you who have gone more recently probably saw images more like that on the right. And in Discovery Bay, although we had beautiful corals, um, we also, at, even back in 1975, we had very few fish in the water. And you can see those tiny little fish up in the right-hand corner of that image, and that turned out to be the downfall of those reefs uh, for a variety of reasons, which I can talk about later if you're uh, interested in particular, but the result was within about 10 years of my going to Discovery Bay, all the coral, or almost all the coral had died and had been replaced by seaweeds, and that's what you see in 1985. So as a result, um, my husband and I, my husband's also a marine biologist, we, um, we spent well over a decade giving talks about how terrible things were on coral reefs, and we, we were so persistent about it. Um, that we came to be called Doctors Doom and Gloom on the lecture circuit. <laughs> I'm not sure if I was Doctor Doom and he was Gloom or the reverse, but I would give talks uh, such as the one you see uh, on the left, um, Coral Reefs, Canary in the Environmental Coal Mine. In fact, I was so depressing, an artist found my talks and my image, and, and because I was talking a lot about ocean acidification, which is one of the negative consequences of all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, he actually did some kind of um, Photoshop magic and acidified my face uh, to talk about how terrible things were. And, uh, and I think he used the quote, it's getting bad and it'll only get worse. And then my husband talked about not just coral reefs, but the ocean. And if you want a really depressing talk, you can go on TED and watch his talk, How We Wrecked the Ocean. Um, it wasn't his title, but it basically that is his talk. So we, we did this for a lot of time. We invested a, quite a bit of time and energy uh, trying to reach out to people to alert them how bad things were in the ocean. Now, there was a problem with that approach, um, and that was that, uh, as social scientists have known for quite a long time, if you only talk about problems and you don't pro talk about solutions, people can't they, they can't care. They'd much rather go to the bar or wherever they go to sort of forget about their problems. And it tends to lead to apathy uh, rather than action. And that's, I think, beautifully illustrated in this New Yorker cartoon where the guy's on the sofa talking to his friend saying, making a difference doesn't make a difference. And in fact, I would say that if you had to point to one social phenomenon that is, gets in our way in terms of making a difference in the environment, it's that attitude that we can't make a difference, we can't make things better. And that's really the, essentially the purpose of my whole talk tonight, which is to show that that is not a valid assumption. And then in addition to sort of depressing people into trying to forget about the environment, the crazy thing about not talking about the successes is it fails to tap into a fundamental aspect of uh, human beings as storytellers, 
uh, and their need for a, a kind of hero's journey. This was something that was actually discussed formally by a, uh, somebody who worked uh, on mythology came, named Joseph Campbell. And, uh, and he had a very complicated uh, schematic for how people began in the ordinary world and then they were alerted to a problem and then they entered in a special world where the problem took over and they had obstacles to fight and all sorts of bad things happened but eventually they emerged victorious and, uh, and then returned to a, a new version of the ordinary world. And every conservation success story on the planet basically has this kind of narrative structure. And so not to take advantage of this narrative structure is kind of crazy for the environmental community. And in fact, there, um, if you want to look at examples of, uh, of, of things that have taken advantage of this narrative structure, you don't have to go any farther than this film. I know if those of you who were here last month saw a lot of film clips. Well, I'm not going to show a film clip but, uh, or a film image except for this one, but this is uh, Julia Roberts uh, portraying Erin Brockovich. Uh, she won the Academy Award uh, for this portrayal of a woman, an, um, an unemployed single mother who eventually who got a job as a legal aid just to pay her bills and eventually uncovered this huge pollution problem with um, a chromium compound and so ultimately sued um, Pacific Gas and Electric and won millions and millions of dollars for um, to repair some of the damage. So that's your classic, um, that's your classic hero's journey. So if you want to see a hero's journey, Hollywood knows how to, Hollywood is really good at telling the story of hero's journey. This is just one of many such examples. But on the left is another example, which I don't think has really been treated by Hollywood as effectively as Aaron Brockovich's story. And that's, of course, the story of Rachel Carson, who um, did not begin, as I'm sure all of you know her book, Silent Spring, and are aware of the fact that she has essentially created the modern environmental movement in the United States. But um, what is perhaps less recognized um, is the fact that she didn't start off as an eco-warrior. She started off as a marine biologist and she wrote a number of very lyrical books about the beauty of the ocean, the sea around us being the most famous of these. And it was only when she started to discover the um, dangerous role that DDT was playing in our environment that she, she entered her version of the special world and uh, started to, uh, she took, four, it took her four years to accumulate the information that's in the, uh, the book Silent Spring. She went, the book was published, she was uh, viciously attacked by the chemical industry, uh, although by today's standards it may not seem that vicious. She was called a hysterical spinster and a bird watcher of all things. Um, <laughs> These days, and it remains the case actually today that female climate scientists are disproportionately attacked on social media compared to men. So it's, a, it's this kind of, we have our own version and much worse, more, much more toxic version of hysterical spinster uh, with us today when it comes to the women who work on climate change. In any case, it's a hero's journey, although she didn't live to, um, to see the entire victory. She was actually dying of um, uh, breast cancer when she testified before Congress, but 10 years after uh, the publication of her book, Silent Spring, DDT was banned in the United States. And now uh, you can see here, I'm sure, uh, uh, bald eagles, uh, which might not be with us if it weren't for the fact that she had waged this war uh, against DDT. So these are two real examples of the hero's journey and the power of that narrative uh, to not only celebrate the successes, but to um, inspire others to make similar differences. So when I got to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, about 1998, I was actually, I had didn't, I'd never heard of Joseph Gamble um, and um, I'd, I'd never read any social science research on the, on the importance of ins inspiring, making people realize that they could make a difference. The whole, it's a whole theory of efficacy in the social science literature. I didn't know any of that. I just went to Scripps and I thought, well, we really need to do something for conservation. So I created with some colleagues the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. And you could think of it as sort of medical school for the ocean. Uh, and then we had a summer boot camp. It was natural scientists and social scientists brought together. It was one of the first such programs in the country uh, because I realized um, that you couldn't solve it with just biology alone. This is really not about changing the behavior of whales. It's about changing the behavior of people. 
And um, so um, we, we gave these lectures in the summer to get everyone on the same page so economists could talk to uh, oceanographers. And my husband and I, since we were very practiced at telling doom and gloom stories, as I mentioned, uh, we begin these lectures with all the horrible things that were happening to the ocean. And we did it for day after day for at least a week. Um, and then sometime in the course of doing this over the first couple of years, I started to dawn on me, I kind of independently discovered a whole field of social science science, which I should have known about, but it, I sort of looked out at my audience of students and realized, man, this is not reaching these people. They, this is not what they want to hear. They, they didn't come to this program to write obituaries of the, of the ocean. They came to do something about it. And I, because I was thinking of our program as medical school for the ocean, I thought to myself, well, you know, at medical school, you don't really teach students to write obituaries, even though we all wind up with an obituary at the end. Uh, what are we doing here? And so that led um, initially to a series of sem uh, symposia that we launched around the country, the first being at the Smithsonian in 2009. It was called Beyond the Obituaries, Success Stories in Ocean Conservation. And in the course of um, running these programs, I came to find a lot more success stories, actually, than I had realized were out there. And so I'm just going to share a few of them with you tonight. Uh, first about the ocean, then I'll move on to the land at the end. So the first is this wonderful project um, uh, that was launched by Steve Kress on puffins. I don't know how many of you know what puffins are, but they, um, they're very common, or they used to be very common on the East Coast, uh, sort of all across the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And, um, and he was a, when he was a young student, he spent time on the islands of Maine where there used to be puffins all over the place. And there weren't any puffins there, despite the fact hunting of puffins had actually stopped at the beginning of the 20th century. So it wasn't they were being killed, but they're just, they just didn't want to come back. And he started thinking, you know, what's wrong here? And then he, and he realized that puffins are a bit like people. We don't like walking in dark, deserted places that makes us suspicious there must be something wrong with this place. Well, similarly, the puffins thought there must be something wrong with these rocks in Maine because there weren't any other puffins there. So he brought wooden puffins to the rocks, and he played puffin songs, and he bought, brought nearly a 1,000 baby puffins to burrows uh, on the island. And, uh, for, and, and eventually, the system worked. Now, it required persistence, which is a theme and confidence and sort of the willingness to see things through even when you don't get a result right away. It's kind of, if there's a theme about being an environmental hero, that's certainly one of them. And um, so it took four years for the first baby puffin to come back to one of these islands. And it took eight years uh, for the first uh, puffins to try to lay their own babies on the island. And it took 35 years to reach 100 pairs. But he did succeed. And not only did he succeed, but this method has now been used in, uh, to restore seabirds all around the world. Because it turns out that puffins are not alone and they're being nervous about deser deserted places. So everywhere where seabird restoration of species that live in large colonies takes place, they use his method. So it's a really, I think, wonderful story. And he was a genuine environmental hero. Um, the second story that I'd like to share with you is, uh, comes from Baja California in Mexico, and it's the story of the Castro family. Uh, this was a very small, impoverished fishing village, and um, they had fished and fished, and they were getting to the point where they're going out more and more, fishing harder and harder, and catching less and less. And so eventually, he, uh, there were some local university uh, scientists working in the area and they had conversations and they told them, they said, well, you know, if you don't set up a protected area of some sort, you're never going to have fish back. You're never going to be able to make an, a, you know, a reasonable living fishing. Uh, why don't you set up a marine protected area? And so he and his family persuaded the rest of the community to set up a marine protected area around Cabo Pulmo. And this was not, again, this was not an easy decision because suddenly people that were used, even though they weren't catching much, they were catching something and suddenly they weren't able to catch anything at all because it was off limits. Um, and it took almost 20 years for the fish to come back, but the fish really have come back. There are about 460% more fish there now than, um, so almost a five-fold uh, difference in the amount of fish there now as compared before. And even more importantly, 
People don't come to Cabo Pulmo to fish. If you go on Google and Google Cabo, Cabo Pulmo, what you'll see is dive vacations because people really like coming to Cabo Pulmo to see all those beautiful fish like the ones you see there on the right. And so he, the efforts of his family, uh, again, not easy and, and they, had, they were long lasting, essentially resulted in the rejuvenation of Cabo Pulmo. And again, this is a model for small marine protected areas around the world. And I think it's particularly striking because this is a, you know, these are people, they didn't have a lot of money. They just had, you know, sort of a conviction and that's what uh, saw them through. And then uh, the last example I'll use um, is the restor restoration of Tampa Bay. And there are actually a couple of interesting stories associated with this. So this is, um, Tampa Bay, uh, like many uh, enclosed bodies of water, um, was really suffering from pollution. And uh, especially fertilizer, nitrogen pollution causes the, the small plants in the water column to multiply so the water gets very cloudy and that blocks out the sunlight and that means the sea grasses on the seafloor uh, don't have enough light and they all die. So um, by, um, by, by about 19, in the 1980s, uh, the amount of seagrass in Tampa Bay had been reduced to less than half of what it had been in the 1950s. And so as a result, a, a bunch of different people uh, got together and formed something called the um, a Nitrogen Management Consortium, which is not the world's most exciting name, but it was a, a group of 55 different entities. They wound up having to engage in about 900 different projects because nitrogen pollution is one of those things that comes from a lot of different places. You can't just turn off a single faucet and stop the nitrogen. So it's a huge amount of work. Cost about uh, $500 million. Uh, but the result was that um, several decades later, um, the nitrogen, uh, the reduction in nitrogen had been so dramatic that sea grasses were back to 1950s levels. Now there are two lessons, there are a couple lessons actually from this story. First is, I think it's really important, we tend to celebrate heroes and I've been giving this, this talk sort of in the context of thinking about singular individuals, but really look at this picture, this is really what happened. And in fact, almost all the heroes that I can talk about in a singular way are, represent large numbers of people working together. And none of the things that are done in the environment can be done by single individuals. We tend to like to have this narrative of the hero, as Joseph Campbell would say, but the reality is, and we have to think about the fact that we need to embrace and celebrate not just single individuals, but all the people that are working together. The second uh, message is that if you look online now, you'll see that uh, the last couple of years have not been great for Tampa Bay. They've lost about 12% of the seagrasses over the last couple of years. And that's a typical story in conservation. It's often two stories, two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back. But think about how bad things would be, be now if they had done nothing, if they were starting at half the number amount of seagrasses. So they're still working at it. Nitrogen levels are still coming down. But the third reason I I uh, have long told this story. It was because it was reported in the news when the seagrasses bounced back to 1950s level, but it was one of these stories, like most stories, it comes, you know, it's in the news for a couple of days and then it vanishes. And the result was that I found that almost nobody knew about this success story. And so I once, for example, and this is just about one example, I went to a meeting in Tampa Bay. It was a meeting of people working on the Gulf of Mexico uh, as biologists. So you'd think they'd know about what had happened in Tampa Bay. And so I asked this room of 200 people. So I told the story and then I asked the people, you know, how many of you know about this, what happened in Tampa Bay, right outside the window? And of the 200 people, only four people raised their hand. It was really shocking. And I came to realize that most, uh, not only did the general public not know, not surprisingly, but even conservation professionals were kind of clueless as to what they had achieved. And so that really made me realize uh, that we really needed to do a better job at sharing the stories of success. And this in, uh, led to a Twitter campaign because I wasn't alone, like most ideas, other people have them at the same time. So a couple of us got together. We had a very tiny workshop, um, about 14 people. And uh, at the end we said, okay, well, what are we gonna do now? And uh, this being 2014, we said, well, let's, let's launch a Twitter campaign. So by email, we voted on hashtags and came up with hashtag 
ocean optimism. And it has since been used by well over 50,000 different Twitter accounts. And it crazily still remains a very good way of finding success stories. In fact, uh, for all the troubles Twitter is having, I have to say it's still a very good way of finding out things you need to know uh, because there's a lot of stuff on there. So if you search for hashtag ocean optimism, you can find, I, I can routinely find about find stories that even though I've been doing this now for 15 years, every day I find new stories of successes that I didn't know about. And so perhaps it's not too surprising then when the Smithsonian launched the, uh, uh, this effort to uh, put a, shine, shine a brighter light on conservation activities at the institution, that this success of ocean optimism led me to kind of crazily suggest to the assembled group who was planning the uh, this entity called the Conservation Commons, which was the idea was to be a big umbrella sort of uniting conservation at the Smithsonian. So I said kind of innocently, well, why don't we have an Earth Optimism Summit? <laughs> Little realizing exactly what I was proposing and how much work it would be. But in the end, I mean, it was a hard, it was, I'd say if this was anything, if I've done anything heroic, this is what I was most heroic because it was not easy persuading people that, that this was not a time, you know, 2017 was not a time people were feeling very optimistic about the environment. And, um, and, no one th and everyone thought, you know, no, this can't work. Actually, even when, I, when we did the uh, first Beyond the Obituaries Symposia back in 2009, I remember getting an email saying, um, how can you have a whole day of success stories in ocean conservation? There aren't that many. You know, a real, and, and, and all this time later, there's still this skepticism that people would, that there were enough success stories, that people would want to listen to them. So in any case, we plowed ahead, sort of like all these other people that kept going, even though they weren't necessarily, didn't necessarily have facts on the ground to support them. They really had kind of this inner conviction that this was the right thing to do. We plowed ahead a big team of people, not just me, um, and we held the Earth Optimism Summit, and it was actually an incredible success. Um, there was 2.5 days and over 240 stories, and they're all uh, recorded. If you go on YouTube and uh, look for Earth Optimism 2017, you can hear, hear every single one. These are the first, these are pictures of all the people that presented whose names uh, go from A to just before LI. So I, I got tired of gluing all these pictures onto a screen. <laughs> um, and I stopped there. But it also kind of gives you, it also illustrates one of the real challenges we have about communicating these successes. And it's a challenge, I have to say, that I am still struggling with. I'm working on a book now about Earth, uh, sort of success stories generally with an Earth optimism theme. And you know, how, do you, how do you make those 240 stories, how do you make the sum great, a whole greater than the sum of its parts? And I, I was looking at this picture actually this afternoon thinking, this is sort of like an AIDS quilt. Um, and uh, all those little pictures, if you step back and kind of make your eyes a little fuzzy, it sort of looks like a, like a quilt. And so I actually think maybe we could, we need, this is not just a question of telling stories, you know, stacking them up. I, I actually think we really, this is where we really need a collaboration uh, with artists to figure out how to make the whole of all of these successes greater than the sum of its parts. But in any case, if you want to hear some of the parts, they're all available on YouTube. So I'm going to um, not. So I'm not going to tell you 240 stories. I'm going to tell you just one, uh, and then I'm going to moving from the, the from the ocean to the land. Um, the story of a woman named Canary Webb. Now she was really committed uh, to saving the forests of Indonesia, and particularly Borneo, because of the amazing biodiversity in those forests, and they were very, very heavily threatened by people cutting down the trees. And so she went to Borneo, and she spent two years talking to some 500 people um, over uh, hundreds of hours of interviews and said, and asked each one of them, why do you cut down trees? Because, and, she, and this is what she calls radical listening. And I actually think radical listening is a key part of environmental success. So the answer she got was not necessarily the answer she suspected. The answer she got was, we, I cut down trees so I can pay my child's medical bills. So she said to herself, well, if that's what's causing deforestation here, then what we need to do is improve medical care. You know, that's much more important than anything else we can do. And so, and they also asked for alternative livelihoods. And so she, as a base, on the basis of two years of listening, she created uh, medical care for the, these communities, 
Um, she also set up alternative livelihoods in terms of organic farming and a variety of other social programs. And the result has been a 70% decrease in deforestation and vastly improved health outcomes for the community. And she now has a program not only in Borneo, but also in Madagascar and also um, in Brazil. And you can read her book as shown here, Guardians of the Trees. Um, Bill McKibben, who is Kind of, who is the founder of 350 um, and is not what I would call the most optimistic person in his book review says, there are very few people who can persuade me there's a reason to be optimistic, but Canary Webb is one of them. So as it was, I thought from Bill McKibben that was a great review. And, um, and you can watch her on, uh, and you can see, you know, find out about her on her website. And, and she's just one of, as I say, one of 240 stories. So I can't tell you all 240, but you can find out some more of them on your own. So I'd like to turn now, because I'm in an art museum, uh, to the role of artists. I was really thrilled to learn about the Artists' as Activists program here. And I wanted to tell you a couple of stories about the role that artists have played as environmental heroes uh, because of where we're sitting tonight. And the first is a project that I was actually involved in at the Smithsonian. Uh, it was something called the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef. So as many of you probably know, uh, coral reefs are in deep trouble and uh, they need a lot of conservation attention. And this was certainly well known to uh, two twin sisters who live in uh, LA, Margaret and Christine Wertheim. And um, they, uh, Margaret's more of a physicist and Christine is more of an artist, but they, because they're Australian, they really cared about the Great Barrier Reef and were really concerned about it. Somehow, reading it, I think reading an article in, in Discover Magazine, um, they found out about the work of a woman actually here at Cornell um, who is a mathematician, and she worked on something called hyper, uh, hyperbolic geometry. Now, I'm sure many of you don't know what hyperbolic geometry is. It's, in fact, even mathematicians had, had, were unable to figure out how to portray it physically. It was a kind of bunch of equations, but it wasn't anything really tangible. But this, uh, the mathematician at Cornell um, realized that hyperbolic geometry is what you get when you're crocheting or knitting, but crocheting is just a little easier, and you keep adding stitches. So instead of a flat surface, you keep adding stitches so the, the stitches don't fit in, so the, the surface gets really roughly. And that roughly surface is a physical manifestation of hyperbolic geometry. Well, it remind, it remind, they started off just sort of interested in hyperbolic geometry, but then started to realize that these hyperbolic geometric shapes reminded them a lot of things living on coral reefs, which is what you see. And so out of this sort of fusion of art and science and conservation and mathematics was this project called the Hyperbolic Crochet Coral Reef. Uh, which consists of, uh, they have a core collection of these absolutely exquisite objects, but they also bring the project to communities. And so we were very lucky to bring it to the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. And I have to say it was one of these things, again, sort of like the Earth Optimism Summit. There was initially, it was a certain amount of skepticism, you know, really, art in a natural history museum. Um, it's like putting science in an art museum. It takes a certain, you know, willingness to take a chance and, and, um, and take a risk, but we eventually succeeded in persuading them. It turned out to be an amazingly successful uh, project. And as you can see here from this picture taken at the exhibit, um, you know, it had very strong transgenerational appeal. It brought in a lot of people to the Natural History Museum who are interested in art uh, and craft rather than in animals and plants. And so it really broadened our audience. Um, and we also, because we did it as a community art project, we brought in all sorts of people into the process of making the hyperbolic crochet coral reef uh, that wouldn't normally be part of the, this kind of activity. And I think the, um, I mean, the pieces, some of the pieces are spectacular. I remember one in particular of a piece of uh, crochet coral, which had a pearl in four corners to represent the four women this person uh, knew who had died of breast cancer. I mean, there are these amazingly personal, intimate stories in each piece. And yet, in the aggregate, it created this enormous reef. It was about 10 by 16 feet in terms of its footprint. And the best press, I have to say, I have ever gotten in my career came from a, magazine, a newspaper magazine called Street Sense, which is the, a newspaper published weekly by and for homeless people in Washington, D.C. 
And so one week during this exhibit, um, the headline was, Homeless Women Stitched Their Way Into the Smithsonian. And I thought that was absolutely fabulous. And in a sort of similar vein, I would come into work at, you know, before the museum would open, and, and, the, and the, all the cleaning staff were sort of clustered around the hyperbolic crochet coral reef. So it was an amazing example of how artists really um, committed to conservation can make a huge difference in getting people aware of an environmental problem and inspiring them to do something. Uh, the second project um, has to do with this gentleman, um, John Weller, who is a photographer. And uh, as he, and you can also hear his talk actually on the YouTube channel uh, for the Earth Optimism Summit. And so he was a photographer. He didn't really know anything about Antarctica. Uh, but he came across somehow an article by a scientist talking about Antarctica and the Ross Sea and how it was really the last wild ocean. And he just couldn't get it out of his head. So eventually he got together with this scientist, started working really closely with him. Then they were joined by a filmmaker. Then they had a meeting, which they brought hundreds of scientists to, to talk about this project about how to protect the Ross Sea. Eventually it grew into a million signatures and caught the attention of many, many people, including John Kerry and even President Obama. And in 2016, the Marine Protected Area for the Ross Sea was created. It involves getting 24 countries to agree to this, including China and Russia, who were the, uh, took a certain amount of persuading, I guess would be the easiest way of saying it. But it was successful. I mean, all these international treaties, you, they, they work by uh, unanimous consent. So you really have to work to get people on board. And so this is a, a great example, I think, of an artist working with a scientist, achieving something really almost miraculous in terms of conservation. And he now has worked on in the Bahamas and uh, Indonesia and a variety of other places on conservation projects. So finally, I would like to turn, again, uh, reflecting where we are tonight, to the role of indigenous conservation heroes. And I knew there would be buffaloes around, although I didn't expect there to be Artemis on the front wall of this museum, which I was really pleased to see. If I hadn't had to turn in my talk a day early, I would have taken a snapshot and inserted it because it was great. Um, and we, of course, have this image of a buffalo hunt on the back wall painted in 1947. Uh, but the story of the buffalo is really fascinating, and there are many, many heroes involved in this story. But suffice it to say that there are also some real uh, villains and including the US government, which uh, basically paid people to kill buffaloes, not only for their hides, because, but be for explicitly, I mean, there is a quote that goes along, something along the lines of, every dead buffalo is one less Indian. I mean, it was a deliberate extermination process, uh, project to remove the livelihoods of uh, Indians who depended on buffaloes in the, in the Great Plains. So, this is a very emotional story from the perspective of indigenous people. And um, by 1900, um, many years before that painting was painted, uh, what had been tens of, um, tens of millions of, um, of buffalo, there were almost as many buffalo in the United States as there are cattle now. I mean, it was a hugely important um, part of the environment. Uh, we're down to less than 1,000. So there are a variety of projects that have been taking place, uh, bringing buffaloes back. Uh, uh, Yellowstone is the only place actually where buffaloes have continuously existed since the extermination. But now Yellowstone is working very closely with indigenous uh, people, including uh, this group, the Intertribal Buffalo Council, uh, to bring buffaloes, to repatriate buffaloes back to uh, indigenously owned lands. And so now there are buffaloes in Washington and Oklahoma and a variety of other people thanks to the work of this um, council. And it's, it's really, it's not only sort of fitting in a justice perspective, but the buffaloes play a very important role ecologically. They reduce food security and they actually lead to uh, potentially healthier diet. So there, it's a win for, uh, and, it, and of course it revives all the uh, traditional uh, cultural practices as well. So it's a huge win for indigenous communities as well as for, um, for the buffaloes. So I'd like to now close with a few comments about what I would have to call the new uh, conservation narrative. And um, many people have been engaged in creating this. Uh, one of my colleagues in, at uh, Cambridge University, Andrew Balmford, wrote this book, Wild Hope. So he and I were kind of working independently um, 
uh, without realizing each of us were focused on the telling the story of success, and that's what his book is about, uh, the, uh, the uh, conservation successes. We actually uh, got together and, and the Earth Optimism Summit was held simultaneously in Washington and in Cambridge. It was a joint effort. And then another, there are a number of books that are like this. This one example is from Catherine Hayhoe. She's a very interesting figure. She's a climate scientist. She's also an evangelical. So, and she's thought long and hard about how to talk to people who are not necessarily receptive to thinking about climate change, how to, how to make a conversation work. So if you, any of you have um, people that you meet at Thanksgiving who seem to be anti-climate change, I, I recommend reading this book before Thanksgiving and uh, getting some idea about how to talk about climate change to people who aren't necessarily on your side to begin with. Um, and so, and the t subtitle of this, The Case of Hope for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. And, there, and so I would say that the conservation conversation has really shifted. Um, it's not just because of earth optimism and ocean optimism, it's kind of a groundswell of realization. And so now if you, there's a, David Byrne of Talking Heads has a website called uh, Reasons to be Cheerful. The New York Times has a section called The Bright Side. The Washington Post has a section called Climate Solutions. And, and just in general, the news coverage is, there, there's a lot more attention being paid to what's working as well as the problems that remain. We can't forget about the problems and there are new problems cropping up all the time. We can't forget about them, but we also have to concentrate on the solutions as well. And in that sense, it brings the conversation about conservation much more like how we cover medical news. Medical news, we hear about the enormous problem with the diabetes epidemic and or you know any other you know long covid i mean you name it there are plenty of problems out there but we also hear stories about people who've come up with solutions and cures and that's really where the conservation narrative needs to be sort of like it's medical it's medical it's medical school for the planet is what we need and we need that kind of uh, coverage so I'd like to just say where we are now. I'd let, uh, going back to UCSD, where my journey began in this realm. My office used to, it was um, two, I had an office and an assistance office uh, right at the base of that pier that you see out there. So uh, way down the cliff. And that's where, um, that's where Beyond the Obituaries began. That's where, uh, the, so the, that's where the students taught me that I was really on the wrong track and I had to get, I had to start talking about solutions rather than problems. And now, they just opened this fall, this beautiful Ted and Jean Scripps Marine Conservation and Technology Facility, something I could never have dreamed of. So this is where it's gone um, at UCSD. And then at the Smithsonian, I'd really like to feature this amazing program, which is a, uh, a collaboration, which is, I think these collaborations are incredibly important, between the Smithsonian and the World Wildlife Fund. It's called Earth Optimism, Youth Action, and leadership program. And uh, right now it's focused mostly in the DC area, but it's expanding around the country. And the special um, area of emphasis is uh, our high schools from underserved communities. And this is very important because conservation remains uh, a field where there are essentially there's not enough diversity in terms of the practitioners, which is particularly um, inappropriate given that underserved communities are uh, almost without exception, those that suffer most from climate injustices and biodiversity losses. I mean, Cancer Alley doesn't, uh, is in, a, in poor parts of the, of the communities, it's not in wealthy parts. And over and over again, you see that not only in the United States, but around the world. And one of the reasons, we had a, um, in fact, one of the people that worked with us in the original Earth Optimism Summit, Brian Coyle, is working very actively with Jennifer on this program. And, and I really like the emphasis on um, both underserved communities, but also young people. Because it's not just Greta who's out there, you know, writing books and screaming. There are thousands of young people working uh, to make a difference for the environment, um, and for both for the planet and actually for their future, of course, because this is the planet that they're gonna have to live on. And I mean, and those of you, I'm sure most of you have uh, interacted with teenagers, and if you have, you know that Teenagers just don't take no for an answer. And that's exactly the kind of personality trait you need to make a difference, as I've tried to illustrate with some of these stories of environmental success. So I think, uh, you know, if you really want to, you know, find an environmental hero, go to your high school, right here, right here in Corning or anywhere else, and you'll find um, uh, lots of them to work with. So I'm very, very excited about the Smithsonian Project and what it represents for the future of Earth Optimism.
And so I guess my final word is really that we can all be environmental heroes. We don't have to be scientists. We don't have to be politicians. We don't have to be artists. I mean, in our way, we all have a role to play. And all these examples involve so many different people making a difference. So many people that I, don't, I sometimes feel paralyzed by how to tell the story because there's so many people and it's hard to tell a story about thousands of people. Um, and so um, I really uh, be, uh, welcome any questions you might have or comments or if you want to tell me about what you're doing uh, here in Corning, uh, any of that is, uh, uh, I'd be thrilled to uh, discuss. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, your stories seem to have a lot of individuals even though they're in groups, but I'm wondering what was the what, if any, were the role of government in these stories? So the, the question is, what's the role of government? And the role of government is actually huge. I mean, I think we're going to be seeing, um, the, I mean, the, especially in the, I mean, there are lots of, there's some problems which really need to be tackled from the bottom up at a local scale, but there are other problems, and I, I would put energy and renewable energy in that category absolutely front and center. You can't, you know, so a small number of individuals don't create uh, massive infrastructure for, um, for wind energy or solar power. And so the role of government uh, to make it um, uh, accessible and just and well-designed, I mean, I think a lot of the things that we're, we're in a very interesting place with respect to renewable energy because I was just, at, I'm on the global board of the Nature Conservancy, for example, and we were just in Appalachia, and the, one of the biggest cause, the biggest cause of deforestation in Appalachia is solar power. So, you know, really how to do this right and how to work at scale is something where, you know, really only the government or the government working with other large organizations. Um, so, it's, and it's not, just, it's not just government, it's also corporations. So, for example, the Nature Conservancy is now working with um, big agro businesses in Brazil to um, try to figure out how to change the incentive structure of agriculture so it can be uh, done on already deforested land rather than cutting down um, tropical rainforests to, to create you know, products for, for soy and other farmers. So I think the role of government is huge. Um, and as I say, in particular, energy and other projects where, where big scale really makes a difference. And also symbolically, um, just in terms of, and, and uh, you know, just sort of leading by example, governments can make a big difference and inspire people. And this, the new um, legislation in the United States actually has the potential to contribute a very substantial part of our um, Paris Agreement uh, commitments to climate change just by virtue of the way the money is being spent. So government's big. I, t I tell the story about people, I think, well, partly because I think people need to realize that, um, I mean, after all, th actually, the story, who, who banned um, DDT? It wasn't Rachel Carson that banned DDT. It was the US government. And then similarly, a very similar story, which I didn't tell, the closing of the ozone hole, which is a big environmental success. That was um, a government acting, actually, in remarkable unanimity. Uh, to do something about the compounds from refrigerants that were causing the problem with the ozone hole. And then also working with cor large corporations to sort of, the, so that the transition to the replacements uh, could be viable. So absolutely, um, but when I'm talking to a bunch of uh, individuals, uh, I often uh, focus on the individuals because I think the stories, you can imagine yourself, you can, might not be able to imagine yourself building a giant wind farm unless you're in that business, but you can not imagine yourself doing something for your, in pollinator gardens in the, the in Corning, so it's a very it's a very good question and very a point very well taken. Yeah, pl the question is, can I give you any reasons for optimism about plastic pollution, especially in the ocean? I think plastic pollution is one. Of, you know, there's some things we know how to do. It's just a question of having the will to do it. There's some things where we don't exactly know what the solution is going to look like, and I'd say plastic pollution definitely falls into the latter category. Um, but there are steps being taken uh, to reduce single-use plastic in, in a variety of states and in countries, uh, and, and disposable you know, bags and also cutlery and all that kind of thing. So that makes a big difference. It's not actually in the ocean. The biggest amount of plastic pollution is, in fact, discarded fishing gear. 
Uh, so that required, that's you know, in reference to what you were saying about the government, that probably involves working with governments and, and large companies rather than individuals. But I think the biggest challenge is that, I mean, there's a reason we have such a, a large problem with plastics, because it's really convenient. It's just, uh, you know, it works really well to, you know, for medical devices, it really works, you know, we can seal up our food, it reduces food waste actually, it reduces cross infection, so it has purpose. The problem is that it, it, you know, for something that only needs to be used for 15 minutes or a couple of days, it lasts for several hundred years. So what we need is um, to find that balance with new materials um, that don't have that kind of longevity combined with greater ability to recycle the ones we do. I mean, some, com some countries are much better at recycling than we are. We, I think, recycle less than 20% of our plastic. But for example, if you go to um, uh, Scandinavia, countries in Scandinavia, they have these little machines in all the supermarkets and all the, and there's something like 95% recycling of plastic bottles. So there, there are lots of solutions out there. They're not being implemented at scale. And there are some solutions we don't yet have. That's how I would describe plastics. So that's partially helpful, but we've got work to do. I wonder if you could speak to um, any individuals or organizations who are particularly heroic in addressing environmental injustice and the idea that um, historically marginalized communities experience the effects of climate change and pollution and that kind of thing at disproportionate rates as they do with so many societal evils. And if there's anyone that stands out to you as kind of leading the way to reverse that, or at least address it or bring attention to that problem. Well, there are a lot of, first, well, there are certainly a lot of individuals who have spoken very eloquently about this problem. And I think the realization that this is a problem is now very widespread. So I can't, I, the one organization that I know really well, because I uh, sit on their board, is the Nature Conservancy. And I can tell you that um, environmental justice and equity is front and center of every single conservation act that's being taken now by the Nature Conservancy. It's part of the core mission. And in fact, nothing gets approved that doesn't, doesn't work in, in the direction of increasing environmental justice and equity. So, I'd say, and I, I don't think that nature, I just know the Nature Conservancy, so I can tell you that for about the Nature Conservancy. I, I suspect the same is true for all the large uh, conservation organizations like WWF. In fact, I know from talking to you that one of the reasons that WWF and the Smithsonian are working together is, in fact, to address an issue of environmental injustice by working with um, teens in underserved communities. So, I'd say, I'd say it's, 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 it's completely accepted in terms of the philosophy of how to operate. The reality is that you know a lot of people, and it's not just um, you know it's people of color, but indigenous people, all sorts of different groups of people are in this category. The people who work in this area are so maxed out trying to, I mean, they get asked to give so many talks, to sit, sit on so many boards. Uh, so that's why, in fact, I think this whole program that you're running with teens is so important because we need these people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. And right now, they aren't there. But if we work really hard at it now, they, they, they will be there in the future. So I mean, I think that's, it's really the capacity, I think, is a big part of the, the, the problem of actually taking it from a guiding principle to a on the ground universal reality. I'm wondering um, if you can give some context for how to think about the heroics and innovation that goes into, you know, tapping into water that's deeply buried, for example, and um, you know, getting access to it. It's been buried for thousands of years, but you know, scientists are figuring out how to get to it. Versus protecting the environment and making it so that the surface water is actually available and and, and there for us to use. So I couldn't quite, I had to take out my hearing aids because of all my years of diving, my hearing is terrible, but, but they were interfering with the and microphone. So can you, re yeah. can, re can you? I'll, I'll have her repeat it. Okay, just because I heard the second half of it, but I, I didn't hear the critical first part. Let me tell me if I'm not paraphrasing it correctly. I believe the question is about 
um, kind of multiple solutions where uh, what is the um, way that people are tapping into deeply buried water, water. versus being able to right, deal with the surface water that we already have and make that um, useful and drinkable and safe. Yeah, that, I thought it was water, but I wanted to make sure I'd heard it with my bad ears. Um, so water is actually a huge problem. It's a huge social justice problem. Uh, and and uh, I mean, there are cities in, large cities in India which were within you know, weeks of having no water, and we are going to be facing that here as well. Uh, and very, in fact, we essentially are facing that in terms of the Colorado River. Um, and so it's a, I mean, it's a complica complicated question. Um, if you, it's, it's a renewable resource, but it's a slowly renewable resource. So you, if, you, if you outstrip the, renewing, the renewal capabilities, then you're gonna ultimately wind up without water. So it's a combination of managing water wisely and, and justly, uh, reducing, you know, reducing water waste, which is a huge problem. Uh, I mean, there, there are solutions out there for that. For example, in California now, they're covering the canals. Or you can actually put solar panels on canals so, to reduce evaporation. So it's a kind of supply and demand um, process. So you have to increase the efficiency with which water is used and reduce the amount that water is wasted and really try not to draw water at rates exceeding the renewable capability. Because if we do, we might be good, might be good for us, but our kids and grandchildren are gonna have a really serious problem with inadequate water supplies. And th there are actually all sorts of, I mean, the Nature Conservancy, again, is involved in various water funds to conserve watersheds. In fact, this part of the country was uh, one of the first conservation successes conserving uh, watersheds uh, to provide uh, drinking water for New York City. So it's actually um, a good example of how to think creatively about um, making sure there's water for everybody. There's, there's water. Uh, I mean, there's some places there's much less water than others, but um, we can solve the problem. It's just a, 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 once again, it's a situation sometimes where politics gets in the way. But, um, but there, are, there are lots of solutions that are being implemented because actually, like is typical of many environmental problems, we tend to get around to addressing them right when they become acute crises, but better late than never. <laughs> grew up in one of the marginalized communities that the Nature Conservancy is working in. Um, I've been working with them for about 18 months or so, and I think you know, they've made such a large impact in our tribal community. Um, I just want to say that out loud as a witness. Um, it's not just words, it's actually action, and I appreciate that. Um, but I also know you're doing a lot of work with um, Longleaf Pine Reforestation and control burns and cultural burns. Mm -hmm. Can you talk some about what that's going to do to the environment? Um, so I'm not, this is not a, you know, the Nature Conservancy is the largest uh, conservation organization in the world. So uh, even though I'm the board, I don't know about 95% of what they do probably. But I do know they, um, I mean the thing about control burns and particularly from an indigenous perspective is that control burns were part of um, uh, land management by indigenous peoples, not only in the United States and Australia and many, many places. And so once we got one, and apparently, I just learned this actually at a Nature Conservancy board meeting this last week. Apparently, Smokey the Bear, uh, which was how we got out of control, the control burn business and decided that all fires must be suppressed. Apparently, it was a wartime effort because the Japanese were sending, um, shooting missiles at forests in the United States during World War II to try to start fires so that we would be distracted from the war effort. I had no idea, I have to say. Um, so in any case, it was partially, and apparently, a national security uh, uh, effort originally. But the thing about Smokey the Bear was it also was a really good branding exercise. I remember Smokey the Bear. <laughs> I think all of you probably remember Smokey the Bear. I mean, it's just, you know, that bear's telling you, don't light fires. And you say, of course not. I would never burn down your home. But, um, <laughs> but the reality is we have to, we have to do controlled burns. I don't know a lot in detail about um, uh, the, 
where indigenous peoples are working with those uh, in the United States. I do know that in Australia, indigenous people essentially uh, plan all of the controlled burns. And it's turned out that these controlled burns not only reduce the risk of really uh, devastating wildfires, um, but also um, improve the plant, the diversity of the, of the land itself. And apparently in Australia, and I suspect maybe in your uh, community as well, uh, uh, p lands without people are considered, they, they describe them as being uh, naked and alone and, and uncared for. And so the, the, the role of indigenous stewardship of lands is incredibly important. And I'm thrilled to hear that. Um, uh, from your personal testimony, that's great. I do know that it was just announced actually at this board meeting that 25% of all of the uh, conservation actions that, that TNC is gonna undertake is gonna be in collaboration with indigenous people. And I sit on, I'm also a, a trustee of the main chapter and there I'd say a huge part of our land conservation involves uh, working with indigenous partners and actually in many cases, sort of without, and, and, and trying to, this is very unlike a, a typical um, major organization, the Smithsonian TNC, but the whole idea is to actually not talk about TNC. I'm talking about TNC's role simply because I know about it, but the whole idea is actually to not emphasize TNC's role and let indigenous communities take, be front and center and talk about it in a way that they find appropriate rather than as a branding exercise to raise money for TNC. So, so the main chapter has been very thoughtful, I would say. And, um, and, a, and a certain amount of effort is at quite a bit of land. Uh, I mean, Nature Services started off as a, an organization that bought land to preserve. A lot of what we're doing now is buying land and turning it over to indigenous communities for management because it's, one of the things, and this has been done in terms of studies globally, is that not only uh, do indigenous people um, live on lands that represent something like 75% of all of the biodiversity on the planet, but if you look statistically at how, what shape the lands are, the lands in indigenous hands are, um, are in much better shape and are much better managed than the lands in non-indigenous hands. So it, it, um, it's a, it's a win for indigenous people and it's a win for, for the landscape as well. And in many parts of the, of the world, uh, the biggest problem is simply, um, is making sure that uh, titles are uh, uh, clear and honored. I mean, there are a lot of indigenous um, lands that, that have no legal status. I mean, they're indigenous labs and that's a big problem, especially if you have a, government, this is where the government can be bad actor rather than a good actor. Bad actor can, um, in, in what happened, for example, to, during uh, Bolsonaro's um, uh, uh, term of office in Brazil was basically disenfranchising of huge numbers of indigenous people, which is really an environmental catastrophe as well as a human catastrophe. So I, I think it's, um, to say I don't think it's unique to TNC. I think it's something that people are really working on uh, for all sorts of reasons, and I, I think I've, it makes me very optimistic. As I say, the biggest challenge is that our partners are so maxed out in terms of all the things they have to do that um, you know they don't have time to come to some board meeting, you know, and present to us. They have you know all these other pressing issues, and and then the other thing I'll say, it was really interesting. We went uh, nature, in addition to this meeting in California, we went to Tofino, which is on Vancouver Island. And um, it was really interesting to me that we had a number of meetings and, and we were shown a variety of places. And then we had this sort of general meeting with the tribal leaders of the, of the particular place where we are at. And, um, and so, we're, so we're at, they, we, we're, we asked, you know, what is most important? And um, I think that for the head of an NGO, what you wanna hear is, well, we need more patrol boats to monitor the lands or we need, you know, we need fencing or we need, you know, we need help with controlled burns and that's maybe not so much there because it's very wet, but um, uh, the, all these sort of things that seem directly connected to conservation. And what we were told instead is we need a community center. And that to me just like was a, almost like a knife in the heart because I realized still the gulf between how people, 
from the traditional conservation community think about things and how indigenous people think about things. And we have so much still to learn and so much that we have to give to really even begin to do the job. So I really appreciate your speaking out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are, but we're out of time, and I promise next time I will start on that side of the room. I apologize to that side of the room. Uh, but thank you so much, Nancy, uh, on behalf of everyone, and we're just so thrilled we got to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you.